Awesome. Just gonna give everybody a moment to jump on. Amazing. Thank you for joining us today, everybody. Just give everybody else a moment. Alrighty, I think we can kick things off because this will be a short 20 minute session. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Emily Kunish and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at First Stop Health. We are thrilled to have you join us today for the first ever 20 minute benefits buzz to talk DEIB initiatives in the workplace and how virtual care can support those initiatives. A few things to note before we kick off uh, today's event. We will be recording this session and we will share it in a post event email. And please feel free to drop any questions into the Q&A and we will answer them towards the end. We have Elena Gambin, Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Growth Officer at First Stop Health joining us today. She will share First Stop Health's three pillars of care that support diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the workplace. Elena, would you like to take a moment to just give a brief introduction and then we can jump right into today's, into today's presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Hi, everybody. It is so good to be here with all of you. And I'm excited to have a quick 15, 20 minutes with you. Hopefully you're grabbing a little bit of lunch and taking care of yourself as you learn something today. Um, as Emily mentioned, I'm the Chief Growth and Strategy Officer at First Stop Health. We are a virtual care company serving over 740 employers and three quarters of a million members nationwide. First Stop Health uh, delivers virtual primary care, virtual mental health, and virtual urgent care. We believe we have an obligation to prioritize the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, both internally in our own culture and workplace, and also externally in our patient care engine so that we can deliver culturally competent care. We serve employers across all industries, but we have a particular expertise and honor in serving what we like to call craft work. So folks in manufacturing, transportation, retail, hospitality, education, people on their feet doing good work every day who maybe don't necessarily have same levels of access to uh, technology, broadband, maybe are in rural areas. And so we know we need to uniquely build and deliver services that take into account the lived realities of those patients and all the patients that we serve. Hopefully what you gain from today is a better understanding of how, as your partner in virtual care, we aim to positively contribute to your workplace. But I also really hope that you come away with maybe a framework for how to evaluate all of the benefit partners that you engage with. You'll go to the next slide, Emily. So we are always learning and evolving on this topic. And I actually can't stress enough how important it is to, to continually be in a state of learning and evolving. But we tend to think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, across three verticals in our service. So the first is around access equity. Regardless of background, demographic, literacy level, financial situation, et cetera, all of our patients should have equitable access, not just to health care more broadly, but specifically to our care across mental health and physical health. So we'll talk a little bit about how we specifically designed the service to enhance that accessibility. The second principle is around clinical competence. Um, and this is where we believe culturally competent care meets patients where they are, creates a safe space where a patient can be honest, also is representative of that patient, meaning a patient feels seen and understood directly by the provider that is serving them and offers an environment where a patient can build trust with a clinician. And lastly, we believe that you cannot embody the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging unless you are constantly assessing your ability to do so. So constant evaluation, both quantitatively, but also subjectively through quality assurance, routine training and ongoing changes in our product that directly responds to feedback from our clients and our patients so that we can make sure that we are constantly addressing the current issues and topics that the people we serve have every day. So we're gonna go through each of these pillars and starting with accessibility. 
the first thing I like to mention here is that inherently virtual care enables equity of access. If you think about the idea of what virtual care does, it in in its nature, it reduces issues around access that pertain to transportation. It creates equity when it comes to geographic barriers. Patients living in rural areas of the country with a provider shortage now have and get access to the benefits of pooled resources and can talk to a physician in an area that they might not otherwise be able to get to. But beyond just the inherent nature of what virtual care does from an accessibility perspective, we also think about improving access in our design. So the first way we think about it is through multimodality use. We know that in order to reach every patient, not only do we have to deliver an exceptional technology experience through a web portal and an easy to use intuitive app, but we have to make sure that there is 24 seven support for patients and our clients via phone. Many patients either don't have access to the level of broadband or technology that we would be required to download an app, but also many patients simply prefer to speak to a live person over the phone. And that can span across generational divides, language divides, et cetera. So the actual modality of access is incredibly important. And you would be surprised the number of patients who offered all three of those modalities select phone over and over and over again because they want to talk to a live human being. The second thing we think about, and this is actually typically what most people think about when they think of culturally competent care, they go straight to language. We know it is so much more than just language, but it is a really important component. So we make sure to provide um, not just multilingual doctors on our platform, but also available translation services for any languages that are more unique or less prevalent in a population, including ASL. So we wanna make sure that regardless of someone's capability of communication, we have different modalities of speaking with them and serving them, whether it be through phone, video, or app. The other thing we think a lot about is how our engagement efforts, our outbound outreach is customized by the person. So one of the principles of engagement that we live by is that any prompting or any reminders about our service will only resonate if they reflect and make sense to the recipient. So think about in your own life, the types of um, information or the types of communications that you respond to. They're the ones that specifically speak to a reality that you are engaged with. And so when we build our engagement and our outreach and try to increase our utilization and our adherence, we really focus on the end user. So every single uh, client gets a customized engagement strategy built on years and years of expertise. And we employ a persona-based messaging technique that takes into consideration the demographic of a patient um, and built personas based on industry that even might resonate differently based on different populations. Another component that is sort of inherent to access equity is cost. We specific, specifically designed our solution to be no cost to the employee or their dependents. And what this means is that an employer paid solution improves utilization and improves access equity because a patient does not feel a sense of fear of potential financial ramifications for trying out our service and then coming back over and over again. We also make sure that regardless of employment status, we are there to support the employer and how they wanna deliver services. So we support those who are on the medical plan, those who are simply medically eligible. We also support part-time employer populations and it is up to the employer if they would like to extend benefits through COBRA. So we are entirely customizable based on the goals of our client partners and how they want to serve their populations across the board. And lastly, and this is one of my favorite pieces in terms of access, one of the things that we've built is we know all households look different. All families look different. And so we allow, we simply allow our employees um, or rather the employees that are served by our solution to decide who they want to include in their household and be considered dependent on our program. And typically we allow up to seven dependents in a particular household to have access at no added cost. The employer simply pays for the primary subscriber, the employee, but that means folks um, who are maybe not living in 
your household, for example, kiddos off to college who are above the age of 26 or parents who are a part of your household are allowed to use the solution, which is a little bit unique in this space, but we want to really be sensitive and thoughtful to how people define their own families and make sure we can support the entire household as a patient needs. The second component of what we do um, is really thinking about how to deliver competence in the clinical setting. So we strive to ensure that our provider networks are demographically representative of the patient workforce we serve. And in the case of scheduled visits, that patients can select for criteria that will more aptly create psychological safety in a visit. So for example, a patient in our virtual mental health who is experiencing grief and really wants to speak to a provider with a particular background and of a particular demographic so that they can understand their situation can request such a provider. Specifically in primary care, we strive to ensure our patients have enough time with their physicians so that they can build trust and un uncover any social determinants of health that may be impacting their healthcare choices. So what happens in a 30, 20 to 30 minute visit with a primary care physician is very different than what happens in a seven to 10 minute visit with a primary care physician, which is the average length of a primary care visit in the United States. The more time you have with the patient, the more trust you build, the better you are equipped to help them manage their own care and deliver what we think of as motivational interviewing to understand what their barriers to care are. At a baseline, First Stop Health prioritizes the breadth, quality, eff efficacy, and training of our providers more broadly. And maintaining this provider network, not just for normal clinical competency, but for cultural competency is incredibly important. All First Stop Health doctors, RMDs and DOs, are board certified in either family medicine or internal medicine with experience, ideally in the urgent care setting, treating emergent care in emergent environments and exp experience treating diverse populations in those settings. These doctors go through extremely rigorous testing and interview processes before being considered for a role at First Stop Health. Providers receive continuous training on our technology, advancements in clinical protocols, and we like to call phone side manner training. So if we are ever aware of a patient experience that is less than optimal, meaning a patient has reported an experience less than three out of five stars, that experience is getting a manual review by our quality assurance team, which is comprised of nurses. And that doctor is being confirmed and educated on how to improve both the clinical experience as well as the phone side manner or video side manner that they were deploying to ensure that the patient continues to feel more comfortable moving forward. So we take this incredibly seriously. We deploy a first level of AI to make sure that all visits are recorded and evaluated. But then we have a team, a manual team of individuals who are specifically dedicated to making sure that the quality is optimal when a patient uses our virtual services. The last prong of this sort of three-legged stool is around assessment. So equally as important as provider hiring and training is ongoing monitoring and evaluation, quality assurance, as I've just mentioned. We evaluate patient experience, utilization, and clinical competency manually, but we also use data to assess any areas of risk that we might be incurring. So metrics across experience, utilization, and clinical competency are comparatively contrasted across cohorts to ensure parity of quality, regardless of patient location, regardless of time of access, regardless of modality of access, regardless of language, and regardless of demographic. So it is incredibly important, in addition to a subjective analysis of your diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging processes, to make sure that there are data feeds in place that continually evaluate your ability to deliver quality parity across different cohorts. So kind of wrapping all of this up into um, an experience or an example. Um, we've selected a, an example that occurred um, just a few weeks ago. Um, and this does specifically target the language issue, which is typically top of mind for our clients. And so we have chosen this to kind of elucidate how we typically work with a patient. 
And this particular patient was a virtual primary care patient. Um, in her late 30s, primarily a Spanish speaker, had a little bit of English, but really preferred to engage with her healthcare team in Spanish. And that was one of the reasons that her, um, her employer actually partnered with us, which was we were able to not only provide outbound communications in the Spanish language, but also manage a patient's journey in Spanish as well. So this member requested an appointment, um, intake was completed, and she initially shared some concerns and questions around fertility, which is one of the um, very common things we see in our primary care practice. The appointment took place with a Spanish interpreter because the individual had selected that they wanted that service so that they could really maximize their comfort during the appointment. All patients are given that option. A follow-up note was sent to that patient with information about what had happened in that visit to make sure that the patient actually understood what occurred and didn't need to necessarily rely on their own memory. That's a really important component of delivering culturally competent care is continual reminders of exactly what your provider shared with you so that depending on your level of health literacy or the language that's being spoken, you have a record of it. We ordered lab work and a pelvic ultrasound based on the clinical indication she experienced. That lab work revealed high levels of cholesterol and prolactin and an ultrasound showed that she probably needed to be seen by an OBGYN for in-person evaluation. So when we recommended that OBGYN after a follow-up appointment that we had with her, we needed to prioritize recommendations of an OBGYN that also spoke Spanish. And that also had a front office staff that had Spanish speaking capabilities so that not just the provider visit, but the scheduling was easy for this patient. We provided that referral to an in-network Spanish speaking OBGYN and an endocrinologist and provided her a second follow-up letter, including all of the information that we had just given her in that second visit, as well as the referral information and dietary instructions in Spanish for her to follow to address some of the cholesterol issues that she was facing. So you can see how every moment of this patient experience was really customized to her needs, including the care that she's receiving outside of First Stop Health. So it really is incredibly important that our providers listen and allow a patient to share what their needs are so that they can continually get the support that they need. So as you think about um, delivering services to your employees and their family members, and if diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is an important principle that you'd like to bring into your benefits practice, Hopefully you can use some of these principles to evaluate other partners and to specifically to think about using our services as well. Um, you see on the right hand side of the screen that our three most important components of what we do is that we make sure employees use the solution, that they love it, that they feel seen and heard and taken care of every single time they call in, and that an employer that we partner with sees meaningful results. And that goes way beyond utilization and ROI. And we really think about results as incorporating positive patient feedback, thank yous, making sure that we're meaningfully contributing to your culture. So thank you so much for joining me today. Hopefully this was an informative 20 minutes and that you can go back to your day a little bit invigorated with some new knowledge. Thank you so much, Elena, for your incredible insights. And also thank you to everyone for joining us today. We do have about two minutes and um, I have some Q and, uh, some questions in the Q&A. So Elena, what are some examples of the employee engagement materials that um, employers can choose from to best meet their member or their employees where they are? Yep. So one of the things we know is that um, the most important part of um, sort of uh, a relationship with an employer is the first 90 days is incredibly indicative of the potential success uh, from utilization perspective. So we really strive to make sure that all initial introductory messaging, whether it's mailers sent to the home or um, emails introducing us to the employees are very high quality and thoughtful. And so those um, pieces can be translated into alternative languages if needed, but uh, making sure that that level of communication is um, prioritized and that we're also partnering with our client to make sure we understand how they communicate with their employees. So a lot of our clients have internal messaging portals and systems. Um, they have preferences around how what we call their employees. Maybe it's team members, maybe it's associates. And so we have to modify how we speak to uh, the employees based on what they're used to, not just as a personal level, but also from the client level. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, thank you again for joining us. I want to share a sneak peek of some of our upcoming 20-minute um, benefits buzz sessions. We'll be hosting a virtual primary care year in review to celebrate one year of virtual primary care at First Stop Health. Um, we'll also discuss the importance of utilization. We'll have one on chronic care management and the effects of Americans foregoing care. And then um, we'll also have one on applying the theory of gift giving into benefits programs. So it looks like we are at that um, 20 minute mark. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and a happy 4th of July. Thank you for joining us today. Bye everybody.